Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. My name is Stephanie. I'm the lead pastor here. I see a few people that I haven't met before. So thank you for the courage to come. We know it takes courage to come into a new community. So thank you for being here and worshiping with us today. Uh, we're so glad to have you. What are some people's uh, things they love to do in their free time? Anybody? Legos. Reading, reading. Did somebody say Legos because they like me? Okay. What else? What? Riding a bike, biking. Okay. Anything else? Art. Okay, sewing. Okay, the list could go on, right? Did anyone else, right as Pastor Adobe brought this question to the screen, have the thought in your mind, what free time are we talking about? Now, most of us, when we spend a little bit more time, we do realize there is some free time, but depending on your life, all of our lives are different, it can be pretty full, yes? I know that my life has felt really full of different seasons. And I saw this meme the other day. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. It said this, I love how being an adult is just saying, but after this week, things will slow down a bit again to yourself until you die. <laughs> and I thought, I think I did just say that to myself. Uh, so in different seasons of life, nearly all of us find this squeeze, right? When it comes to how full our lives often feel. And I think about this, I think we have like between 110 and 120 waking hours every week, and we're all trying to figure out how to get the most out of every one of them. Whether it's working and playing and resting, we cram it all into these like 115 precious hours of our lives. And what fills these hours for most of us? Well, it's not hard to, to think about what fills these hours, right? Time at work, caring for others, what I call the list of things, which is not just the to-do list, but extras, right? From making sure we go to the dentist, making sure we pay the bills, the yard work, the cleaning work, make sure we do the laundry, make sure we get to those recitals and to those uh, basketball games and those soccer games and make sure that, oh, the bachelorette party, the bachelor party, and all of the showers and the graduations and all the things, yes? The list of things. Make sure we get that card for Father's Day. Somebody doesn't have it on your list of things right now, it's time to add it. There's still time, you can get the card. Most people feel like it's hard to find time in our very full lives to even do the things that we love to do as hobbies, much less to find the time to truly prioritize our relationship with Jesus to really think about what it means to prioritize the depth of the desire that most of us have to be intentional about our faith and how we follow Jesus. And so this summer, we're having this conversation where we're trying to look closely at the words and the works and the ways of Jesus and think intentionally, what would it look like to engage discipleship for the lives that we're actually living? like the pretty full lives that most of us have. And so we're calling this conversation Apprenticing Jesus in Real Life. Discipleship for the lives that we actually have. And we're going to be using this word apprentice and discipleship kind of interchangeably. Um, tell me the word in Hebrew, uh, disciple or apprentice. Apprentice is actually a pretty good definition because it helps us know what an apprentice does. What do, does a disciple do? One who spends time with their teacher one who learns from them and then becomes like them. Spends time with them, learns from them, and becomes like them. So today we're going to be talking about what it looks like to apprentice Jesus in our vocations. In our vocations. Now I want to suggest that most of us, our vocational roles take up the majority of our waking hours. And you'll see what I mean when I show you my definition of vocation for today. Vocation, a person's employment, main occupation, and intentional roles that they play in life. When you think about that breadth of that definition of vocation, that means our vocations can include what we get paid to do, but it can also include caring for children or who would, adults who need care. It can be doing the work needed to thrive in our lives and to help the people around us thrive. Uh, one of the phrases that's being used is kin work, K-I-N, kin work. Maybe you've heard of it. If you haven't, Google it. Kin work is the work that's done to keep people connected and to make sure people have what they need. The relational work that holds the fabric of society together from our homes to our workplaces to our extended families. The ways that families connect each other, support each other, the ways that friendships can meet each other's needs. For instance, when I was writing the sermon, I got to this point right here and I realized I was late to pick up my mom at the airport. 
right? So I just like slammed the laptop shut, grabbed the keys, got in the car, because we can't be late for Karen. She needs someone on time. And I made it right then. And the question becomes, like, what was my vocational activity, writing the sermon or picking up my mom at the airport? The answer is both. Both of those vocational roles as a pastor and as a daughter are important roles. And so they are both important vocational activities for me to do. And it's important that I show up for my mom and not be late as much as possible. So when we think about this concept of vocation, it's not always paid work. Sometimes it's work that we are volunteering in different ways. If we are looking for work, that is your vocation, an important part of your vocation. If you are in school, if you're a student, that is a core part of your vocation. Our vocation includes all of the intentional roles that we play in life. From social worker, to dad, to engineer, to mom, to grandparent, to friend, to teacher, to volunteer, to high school student, to business major. These are all the roles we play as a part of our vocations. So while our vocations shift over time, some of us have experienced a number of shifts in our lives, here's something important. Our multifaceted vocation is not something that we ever completely retire from. And that's a good thing. There's purpose for us in every season of our lives. However, we can often feel like we have very little time for our hobbies, much less to be intentional in our apprenticeship of Jesus because we spend nearly all of our waking hours doing these various vocational roles and engaging in those roles. And here's the thing. It's important to recognize that I think that our vocational roles probably shape us and form us more than any other thing in our lives. Not just practically, but spiritually form us and how we understand who we are and why we live. And then we need to realize what if what feels like endless hours of doing jobs at our work or endless hours of caring for kids or learning at school if that is potentially our greatest opportunity to apprentice Jesus? What if our vocations are the primary space in which we apprentice Jesus? That's what I want to suggest today, that the thing you spend most of your time doing in your waking hours is your primary space in which you apprentice Jesus. It's in the midst of those roles, of those workplaces, those tasks, where we see our opportunity to know God to live like Jesus, and to be led by the Spirit. That's kind of our definition of apprenticeship. To know God, to live like Jesus, and to be led by the Spirit. In your vocational roles and spaces, we get to do this. It's maybe the most important place we get to do it. So as we look at our passage in Luke today, Jesus makes what I think is a brilliant take on vocation. I want you to pay close attention. He sends these apprentices, these disciples, out to do what they have seen him do. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Luke 10, or pull out an app. We have some Bibles in the pews as well. And let me give you just a little bit of context on the, the Gospel of Luke here. Luke is one of the traveling companions of Paul, uh, the, one of the early leaders in the church. And as he is traveling with him, one of the things he's doing is, is documenting the story of what happened in Jesus' life and ministry. And what we also know from history is that Luke is a doctor. He's a physician as one of his vocations. And so as we lead up to chapter 10, we're going to look today, we've seen the birth of Jesus, we've seen where Jesus steps into his ministry, we've seen him do miracles, heal people, call these disciples to follow him. They've witnessed all of this. And as we read in, in uh, Luke 9 last week, we see this declaration that Jesus makes of what it means to apprentice him in verse 923, whoever wants to be my disciple must give up your own way and take up their cross daily and follow me. And then we turn the page to chapter 10. And the disciples, the apprentices of Jesus, are sent out by Jesus to put into practice what they learned. Now, pay close attention to the multifaceted concept of vocation. Try not to miss what Jesus is saying here as we read through these first 12 verses, okay? Starting in uh, Luke 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. Let's pause here for a minute. So he's sending these the, the apprentices. Now there's 72. We sometimes hear of the 12 apprentices, but there's these 72 now. He's sending them out in pairs. Important 
to the places where he's about to visit. So they're going out ahead of him, but we also know that he's with them in his, in his spirit. Now, he warns them here that he's not, they're not always going to be safe, which is very true in that time of what they were experiencing. A little strange, he tells them not to bring anything, right? I don't think we know for sure why he tells them to do that. But my sense is, I think Jesus is showing them that they need to rely on other people to provide for them. Not even just anyone, but strangers. That is hard for us, isn't it? To rely on other people to meet your needs. And then we see this very important phrase. I want you to pay attention to it. Jesus starts off, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You hear the vocation language? And the Lord of the harvest, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Let me just take, uh, continue on to verse 5 here. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Does it seem odd to anyone else that they are just walking up to see if they can come and stay in someone's house? Okay, because I know we're Minnesotans and we'll like give people instructions to anywhere but our house. And that's like maybe part of our thing we need to work through. But generally speaking, Walking into someone's house unannounced, you know, this is, a, this is not t- typically cultural for us here. Um, has anyone tried this without getting arrested, just walking into your neighbor's house? Okay, so I think there's an actual answer to this one, though, okay? So let's just hold that for a minute. From this passage is where uh, we get a phrase we sometimes use here at Mill City, people of peace. People of peace. And what we mean that by that and people who use this phrase means that it's the Holy Spirit that promotes peace between you and other people in the spaces that you find yourself in. And when God is doing something like that, we need to pay attention because if we follow that peace, there's something the Holy Spirit wants to do between us and the people that we're encountering. When we notice that the Spirit is leading us to people, what we need to do is see, can we follow that peace and then let the Spirit lead us into how we engage with that person? But then Jesus, you'll see here in a minute, he just kind of says, but if there's not peace there, that's okay because it's up to God who puts the peace between people. And so these people of peace are the people who will be open to who you are. They'll be open to the way in which you encounter them. And they are probably going to be the people who are most open to you sharing about who Jesus is to you and that story in your life. Let me finish reading the instructions that Jesus gives in verse 8. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near. But when you enter the town, are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for this town. Now, this is this moment where Jesus is saying, leave the people to me. If they don't welcome you, that's okay. Just move on. Jesus does say then, though, if you do encounter the people of peace, there are some instructions. Receive what they give you. Did you see the language wages? That vocational language, wages in some form. Eat what is offered to you. Pray for healing. Tell people the kingdom of God has come near. This is important. Remember, Jesus is going to come. Jesus himself, right? So the kingdom is going to come. The kingdom is near. So maybe we could summarize these instructions in this way. Go, stay, eat, heal, tell. If you just wanted to have a shorthand of what Jesus is saying. Go, stay, eat, heal, tell. Now there's plenty of sermons we could preach on this little hint, there may be another one coming, but I want to zoom in on the concept of vocation. The way that Jesus talks specifically about the multifaceted vocation that we experience in this life. In the description of the mission he's sending the 72 on, he kind of has like a big header, like his big, this is what I'm going to send you to do. The 72 apprentices are gathered and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, I want to propose to you today that Jesus is doing something really cool here. He's intentionally doing a double meaning. Man, I love when Jesus does things like this. Look at what he's doing. We might miss it if we don't pay attention. First meaning, I think Jesus is using the image of harvest to talk about people. The people who are ready to hear the good news of Jesus, right? A harvest is ready to be brought in. People are ready to hear about Jesus. This is why oftentimes we sometimes use the metaphor of the harvest to talk about evangelism or sharing the good news with people who are ready to respond to it. 
are ready to step into what it means to be an apprentice of Jesus themselves. But I think there's a second meaning. I think Jesus is actually talking about the actual harvest season where there's workers who are needed in the fields. It's so cool how he's doing these two things at once. These crops need to be harvested. So think about this. Jesus is sending them out to join households who have fields in need of harvest workers so that they can gather the crops in time. This is a very real thing still today. So when you look at this text, and I just want us to go through, it actually, in my opinion, makes more sense if we see that Jesus is both talking about the literal harvest and the spiritual harvest at the same time, okay? So he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Jesus says, this phrase is important, we should do this. That was a common phrase that people would pray, talk about all the time because they really believed that God is the one that makes things grow. So similar to many places here in Minnesota and other places in the Midwest and around the world, they rely on migrant workers to travel to farms during the harvest season to be hired for a couple of months to ensure that all those crops are harvested in time. So imagine this, coming to a house and saying, I hear the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few would be good news to someone who needed workers. And they would welcome you right into the house and they would say, well, can we get you to eat? Here's where you can stay. Why do you need some food? Because I need you to be fueled up to do the work in our field today. And so this is an important thing. They'd be so glad to see you. And then Jesus says, you don't need to work for free. That'd be a little bit weird. Yes, I have you on a spiritual mission as well, but take what they offer you because you're working. That's a good thing. So you can imagine they would join in like a group of maybe dozens of people at times, depending. And a household would be having this harvest season where there's dozens of people coming together. Households at that time were typically larger, maybe more like a compound or maybe how we would think of a farmstead, where there'd be places for people to stay during the harvest season. And so they'd be working alongside people for hours and hours together doing this important work. And Jesus gives them these instructions. Stay with them. Don't move from house to house. Because it'd be pretty rude to feel like you're the answer to someone's prayers and then you leave before you got too much work done. You need to stay, build trust, show commitment, show that you're here for the important value that they have, which is the work that they have to bring food, not only for their community, but probably for the wider community. That's what farmers do. And so they need to stay. Then Jesus says, pray for healing. Now, it doesn't take too much imagination to think about the healing needed amongst a group of migrant workers. They're using their bodies to be able to do this job. And so if their bodies were not functioning correctly, their very livelihood depended on it. And so if they had a dysfunctional knee or a bad back, there weren't, you know, hip replacements in the first century, they would be in trouble. And so if someone's working alongside them and said, well, can I pray for your knee? And they prayed in the name of Jesus and it was healed. This would be showing a miracle. It would be showing kindness to their physical body, but also to their whole well-being. And to the, the fact that God cares about their work and God cares about what they're doing. Finally, Jesus says to them, tell people the kingdom of God has come near to them. Now, I'm not sure, but I don't think that they were just saying, you know, the kingdom of God has come near in some sort of announcement, you know, curt announcement. But think about this. The apprentices have been with Jesus. Think about all that they had seen. And if they had just experienced people being healed, I feel like it would just make so much sense that they would be like, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about what we've seen. We've seen him heal all these people just like you were healed. We've seen him set people free from spiritual oppression. One time he walked on water and then there was this huge storm and with just his words, the wind and the waves obeyed him. And speaking of your industry, the food industry, man, just last week we were with him. We didn't have any food and he took five loaves of bread and fed thousands of people with it. It was a miracle. And let me tell you this. He says it's all possible because the kingdom of God is close by and it's in our midst now. And guess what? Jesus is coming here to you. So the first time that we see Jesus send out a larger group of people is here where he's sending these 72 apprentices out and he sends them out to go get a job. Like, go get a job. And yes, he gives them some important instructions to love the coworkers that they work alongside. 
Jesus is giving instructions for joining in and working in an important industry, a critical industry. But he's also giving instructions of how to encourage and engage coworkers for the sake of the kingdom of God. This dual meaning is so powerful, if you ask me. It's so empowering for all the different roles that we play in our lives vocationally. Look at this framework for apprenticing Jesus. We're going to use this in, in these conversations this summer. And we talk here often about our up relationship with God, our in relationship with our community, our friends, and then our out relationship, the people we're called to love in the name of Jesus. And when we talk about knowing God, living like Jesus, and being led by the Spirit, we see this here modeled in Jesus' life. Jesus has a relationship with the Father. And it's that relationship with God that propels him into his community and propels him on mission. And he retreats back to that relationship with God so he can step further into these other relationships. That's what living like Jesus looks like. But Jesus is consistently led by the Spirit time and time again, listening and responding. You can see it says Jesus is led by the Spirit in multiple places. And that's how he know, knows who and where and what. Because he's so in tuned with the Spirit. And so as we look at these steps, can I invite you, think about like the top two vocational roles that come to mind for you right now. Whatever they are, maybe they're the ones that take the most time right now. Maybe it's paid work, maybe it's childcare, maybe it's uh, teaching, well, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a role as a parent or a grandparent, maybe a volunteer. What are the two roles? Can you put those in your head, just be thinking? The top two vocational roles for you in your life. And the question is, what does knowing God, living like Jesus, and being led by the Spirit look like for you in those vocations right now? Okay, so starting with knowing God. When Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest, those 72 apprentices who had memorized a lot of the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures or the Old Testament would have immediately thought of Genesis 1. The Lord of the harvest is God because God created the world and plants were God's design. God designed these plants, why? For food. That was a main purpose of the plants. But they would also have known right away when they heard Jesus say, pray to the Lord of the harvest, they would have known that the very first vocation, the very first job that was given to the humans is when God said to the humans in Genesis 1, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, and they will be yours for food. The very first job that the humans were given by God was to co-work with God to care for the plants and the animals. And then we see in Genesis 2.15, then God put the humans in the Garden of Eden to work and take care of it. The first job, okay? So if someone, if you know farmers in your life, if you experience farming, that's a first job, all right? And if someone's like, nah, there was a different, I don't know, this is the first job. We see it right here at the beginning of Genesis. Genesis literally means the beginning, okay? So Jesus is sending out these 72, he is God in the flesh, Jesus, and here he is, mirrors Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and he sends the apprentices to participate in the very first vocation given to, to humans when they were created. I just don't think this is an accident. That Jesus is doing a really cool callback where he's like, all right, we're sending you out. Of all the vocations that he could send them out to do, he chooses to send them out to work the ground to take care of the seed-bearing plants for food. Of all of the different vocations, it can't be an accident. Jesus didn't even pick the vocation that he had prior to doing his ministry, right? He picks this one over all the others to send the 72 to go out and get these jobs specifically. And I think Jesus is making something really clear that we can know about God and that we can trust in our relationship with God when we realize Jesus' dual mission and dual purpose of what he's saying. I think Jesus is expressing God cares about our work. The work itself, God cares about our vocation. He, God cares about the things that we're doing. Yes, God also cares about our coworkers. Can't miss that, right? But God cares about how we co-work with God. Because the work that we do in all of our vocations represented in this room, think about this, all of your vocations image God in some way. Might seem like a weird way to say it, but we're created in the image of God. And so when we are doing the work that we do, we are living out the way that we are made in the image of God, joining in with who God made us to be, the very breath that we're given every day to live and to image God in the work that we do. Have you thought about that? Think about the vocations that you have. When the 72 apprentices went out, 
They were imaging God as they brought in food that gave sustenance to people as they were caring for these plants and these crops. But they were also imaging God when they prayed for healing and when they shared that the kingdom was coming and they shared about what they had seen, what Jesus had done. Wouldn't it be a huge miss if we only saw the prayers and the, and the preaching about the kingdom as imaging God when they were actual physical actions they were doing were imaging God as well? God cares about their work. Everything they were doing was showcasing how they were made in the image of the Lord of the harvest. So look at this list, okay? I'm gonna, I got a big long list here. I have it on the hub because it's a lot, but look at this list. This is not even all of them. It, it goes all the way off the page. Okay, the, voc- the ways our vocations image God. How many of these boxes could you check in your various vocations? Bringing organization from chaos. Someone's like, is that about kids or spreadsheets? Yes. Sustain or produce resources for the flourishing of life. Organize spaces necessary or helpful for the flourishing of life. Help bring light to dark places and experiences in the world. Provide care or healing. Bring life, care for life, sustain life. Bring beauty or use creativity. Learning and being formed so you can live a full life. How many of you checked so far? Tell or share stories. Help people understand their purpose. Help people learn and receive resources for living a full life. Help people overcome barriers to living a full life. Support or lead coworkers in your line of work. Offer food or nourishment. Foster relationship or communication between humans or with humans and God. Help people rest or help people create spaces for them to recreate or recreate. I mean, the list could go on. And as you go through the story of God, this is who God is. This is what God does. And this is what God created us to do as we image God. No other beings are created to image God like this. This is an incredible thing. And so I want to just encourage you. I did. I put this on the hub on our blog. So you can just look through and remind yourself on those days where it's really hard. I am imaging God in all these actions that I'm taking that sometimes feel like a lot. But it matters because we are doing these things because God created us that way to co-work with God. And God is with you right there every step of the way. So the first question, do you know in your mind, but also in your heart, in your soul, that God cares about your work and your vocation? God cares about your work and your vocation, the very work that you do. But let's ask that next question then. Live like Jesus. When it comes to our vocations, both paid and unpaid, what does it look like to live like Jesus? So it's important for us to remember, of course, Jesus lived a powerful ministry for three years. But before that, he learned what he knew about apprenticeship from apprenticing his dad as a carpenter. That's where Jesus first learned what it looked like to spend time with your teacher, to learn what they did and to be like them. This is what Jesus did. And I love this writer, uh, Dorothy Sayers, if you've read any of her work. In 1942, she was talking about this idea of apprenticing Jesus in our workplaces and how we can, if we choose, to really take this encouragement from Colossians 3.23. Some of you know this one. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not human masters. Whatever you do, as you're imaging God, do it with all of your heart. And she makes this really poignant observation. She says, Let's imagine there's a carpenter. Now, this is in 1942, right? Imagine there's a carpenter who wants to be a follower of Jesus. And he comes to think that to follow Jesus, he needs to live a pious life. He better not miss church. And he needs to try to avoid all of his vices. That's what it means, right? To apprentice Jesus. And then she says this quote. What use is all that if in the very center of his life and occupation, he's insulting God with bad carpentry? No crooked table legs or ill-fitting drawers ever came out of the carpenter's shop in Nazareth. Nor, if they did, could anyone believe that they were made by the same hands that made heaven and earth. I just love that. To live like Jesus, we engage in our vocations with all our hearts. And since we're not Jesus, guess what? There's probably going to be some crooked tables sometimes. That's okay. (laughs) But to live like Jesus, we choose to recognize and to live into the reality that it honors God. And it's an act of worship when we do all of our work with all of our heart. Think about it. It's an act of worship when you pack what seems like the millionth lunch for those kids. 
It's an act of worship when you turn in yet another project to that professor or another report to that supervisor. It can be an act of worship as you build that website or as you teach that class or as you facilitate yet another Zoom meeting. Living like Jesus in your vocation means all of this. And it might mean other things like having hard conversations and being a peacemaker even when it's really difficult. It might mean living like Jesus is confronting a conflict that everybody else seems to be ignoring and letting the Spirit lead you in that. Living like Jesus might be speaking up when it seems like some things are pretty questionable ethically and it's a risk for you to do that in your workplace. So the second question, live like Jesus in your vocation. How might you work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord? And that question how is pretty connected to this last part, being led by the Spirit. If our time is mostly spent engaging in our vocations, then that is the most prominent place that we're going to be led by the Spirit. Yes, I hope the Spirit encounters you here in this room and in times of Bible study and prayer and to spending time with people, but the Spirit of God is at work in the places where your vocations are lived out. That's maybe the most prominent place. And Jesus giving this double meaning here in Luke 10 points out that we are led by the Spirit in how we do our work, but also we are led to who we do our work with. The specific people that we're invited to connect with God, God invites us to connect with in a specific way in our vocational spaces. So then the question becomes, how is the Spirit leading you towards the people that are your coworkers or your classmates or the parents of those friends that are on the soccer team with your kids or those people that you're serving or that you serve with in that volunteer activity or perhaps when you are treating clients or you're engaging with people from the other companies or as you're spending time with your students. These are all folks that Jesus calls us to love in his name. Even if it's through a computer or Microsoft Teams, that's it. Those are the spaces. In our passage, we saw those instructions, right? Let's put them up again. Go, stay, eat, heal, tell. We are going to come back to these in a couple weeks, but look at this. Consider today, when it comes to those vocations in your life, go, stay, eat, heal, tell. What does this look like? Go, get a job. <laughs> like, you know, like go. Some of you already did that one. Check. All right. Look for a job. You're doing it. Got it. Look for people of peace. And when you find them, stay. Stay with them. Build relationships with them. It takes time to build trust, maybe now more than ever. It takes time to build trust. Being trustworthy people. Eat. Okay. I think eating is awesome, but also it represents just everyday life. That it's not just about the output of the work that we do, but about the people's lives that are affected. Do you ever just feel sometimes in different vocations like you're just like a cog in a wheel? You're not. You're a person, and so is your coworker. When we eat together, we remember that we are whole beings, and you can spend time doing everyday life with people. And then healing the sick. We can pray for people who need healing spiritually, emotionally, physically. And listen, I'm well aware that praying with people directly is not encouraged in a lot of workplaces. I get that. But that does not stop us from praying for people in our hearts for their healing. What if, what if we were praying for people that we work with that are annoying more than we were complaining about them at home? Whoop, baby. I believe that things would change. I absolutely do. I believe that if we prayed for people, it would change us, but I think it would change the circumstances. And I have heard many stories that if, and I've experienced this myself, if we ask the Spirit to lead us, we end up having opportunities to actually pray directly with people. It's the Spirit that opens that up, not us. We can't force that. And then finally, tell. Tell them the kingdom of God has come near. Now, if you would like to, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you can come in to Zoom call and just say, the kingdom of God is near. <laughs> I personally don't think that's the best option to, to for, you know, walking into a new workplace and saying, hey, everybody, the kingdom of God has come near. I don't think it works awesome with kids either or whatever space you find yourself in. So the question becomes, how is the spirit inviting you to live into the way of the kingdom and to speak about the kingdom specifically in the spaces that you find yourselves in? That's maybe a better approach just to ask the spirit to guide you. Are we asking the spirit to guide us? And then it probably looks more like the spirit saying, you need to step in the gap with those people on the margins. Or the Spirit tapping you on the shoulder and saying, this person over here needs to feel seen and affirmed in the work that they're doing. 
How is the Spirit leading you to express the way of the kingdom and the way of Jesus in your vocation? Because I also believe that if you ask the Spirit to lead you, the Spirit does open up opportunities to share your story about what Jesus has done in your life. Let me tell you about what Jesus has done for me. And those opportunities open up sometimes with the people you would least expect. Now, one more thing. I do think the order of Jesus' instructions is kind of important here. Right? Go, stay, eat, heal, tell. Somehow, a lot of us got the impression the number one thing right away to do is to start with tell. So this is just a good point for us, okay? I'm not saying the Spirit won't, won't do that. But generally speaking, I think Jesus is giving a principle here that you need to go towards the people with the peace, stay with them and build trust, do some life with them, go, stay, eat, and then let the Spirit lead you towards healing and telling. And similar to Luke 10, when we tell about the kingdom, we're trusting, just like in this story, that Jesus is going before us, Jesus is with us, and Jesus is going to come behind us. Guess what? That's actually the way that someone's going to encounter Jesus. Nobody in here has ever convinced somebody to be an apprentice of Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. We just get to be a part of it. And we didn't even need to be. God just gave us the gift of being a part of those incredible stories where we get to say, let me tell you about Jesus when the Spirit opens that up. So that's kind of our last question. In your vocational spaces, who are the people of peace you're invited to go towards? The people of peace you want to move towards to be able to encounter. So I'm going to have the band come up, and I want you to think again, as they're coming up, about those two roles in your life I invited you to think about again. And we've got these questions up here, and we're just going to give you a minute before we go into our time of worship and communion just to reflect on these. Take a picture of them, write them down. Because these are our questions for those vocations that are most critical for you in your life. So take just a couple minutes and we'll go into our time of worship and communion.